Okay, so since we have more or less developed all the technology we need for talking about derivatives and optimization, I now want to kind of apply that to get some nice interesting results. So in the first act, we'll have some what I would call context-rich problems, or in other words, just interesting problems that can be solved with optimization stuff. So these are things that are you know, kind of challenging, several steps, but we'll grind through them. Uh, next, this is something which is very useful in physics. Uh, I dislike that in standard high school calculus courses they kind of compartmentalize and label these problems related rates. I really dislike that term. But this is really just a new application of derivatives, which is when you have some physical system, taking time derivatives of things can give you additional data. And I will make that more precise uh, when we get there. And then Act 3, we won't quite get to proving it, but the last thing that we'll use derivatives for in this chapter, this chapter 4 stuff, will be something called L'Hopital's Rule, which is a French name that is spelled in many, many different ways. Sometimes you'll see it written like L'Hopital with an S, like hospital. I don't know. But anyways, it's, it's just a rule named after a French guy. And we will state the rule today and then probably prove it next time. So, okay. Let's dive into the interesting optimization problems. So, the first part will just be a bunch of cool applications of the optimization stuff we've seen. Okay, so first, just to review all of the results that we have, I think at the last meeting we ki got kind of the last results in our utility belt, kind of the set of, of optimization results that we'll need. So we've seen, for instance, that by combining the extreme value theorem and the things that we proved, I think now three sessions ago, we've learned that every differentiable function on a closed interval will achieve its maximum and minimum on that interval, and those both occur at points satisfying one of these three conditions. They're either critical points where the derivative is zero, f prime equals zero, a boundary point, which is one of the endpoints, a or b, or a point where the derivative is undefined which rarely comes up in these sort of simple Calc 1 questions, but it's good to keep in mind. Uh, a different way of staying, stating the same thing, which we proved, I think, in session 29, is that if you know a point is a maximum or minimum, or even a local maximum or local minimum, on an open interval, and the derivative is defined at that point A, then one can prove that the derivative must vanish there. So this is yeah, an equivalent way of stating that critical points are one of these three possibilities, and the other two possibilities are places where these assumptions fail. Okay, good. So something we didn't state explicitly, but we have used without giving it a name, is that this thing called the first derivative test, that if you have a function, say, I don't know, maybe it looks like, looks like this in the vicinity of some point, and you're trying to decide whether a point where the derivative vanishes is a max or a min, one way to decide that is called the first derivative test, and it tells you that if this thing, I'll, I'll look at the minimum case, which is the second paragraph, but if you know that the derivative is negative on some open interval to the left of the point C you're interested in, so here we can see the function is decreasing to the left of that point C, and the derivative is positive, or at least non-negative, on some interval to the right of C, so the function is increasing here, then you know c is a local min as opposed to a local max. And clearly if you reverse those inequalities, so the derivative is positive to the left and negative to the right, then it's a local maximum. I'm just stating this explicitly because when we do these sort of context-rich problems, I think it's important to check when you find a critical point, is this actually a maximum or is it a minimum? So you have to check because depending on the problem you're interested in, maybe you want to maximize or minimize something and you want to be sure you found the right one, not the opposite of what you want. Another thing we proved, which is I think equivalent to the first one, sometimes easier, is that you can check whether a point is a local max or a local min by looking at the sign of the second derivative. So for instance, in the picture I've drawn here, the second derivative at C is positive because the guy is convex, he opens up. So that tells you that this thing is going to be a local minimum as opposed to a local maximum. So these are two equivalent ways of checking at a given point where the derivative vanishes if you're at a max or a min. 
So, okay, this is just more or less a rehash of everything we've proven so far. But uh, thoughts or questions on the rehash? I have no thoughts or questions. Okay. Then, all right, so then a quick kind of recipe for solving these sort of optimization problems and the example to keep in mind was the thing we did I think last time or two times ago that of all I think it was rectangles actually of all rectangles with fixed perimeter we optimized the area and found that the square has the largest so if you recall what we did when we when we worked out that proof we started by writing a formula for the area area is length times width and then we said well that kind of sucks because that is a formula involving two variables and we only know single variable calculus so far so we'd like to get that down to one variable to do that we notice well the, f the perimeter is fixed so let's use that to eliminate one of the variables in particular we wrote a formula for the perimeter in terms of length and width use that to eliminate w and then said okay great now that's a formula which gives a as a function of l and we know how to maximize that thing so that's the example we did. Now I'm just kind of pointing out the steps that we did because these will generalize very nicely. When you're handed an optimization problem or really many calculus problems generally, the steps which kind of you know implement this recipe are first to restate the problem in terms of extremizing a function, for instance, the area. Then if you have multiple variables, say length and width, you want to use a constant like the perimeter if the perimeter is fixed. You use that to eliminate a variable so that your function is now a function of a single variable, one variable alone. Then you use the tools that we described on the previous slide. You maximize or minimize by looking at points in those three groups, say the endpoints and critical points and places where the derivative doesn't exist. And of those points, you pick the one with the highest or lowest output, depending on what you're interested in. Okay, so that's just the broad strokes picture of what we've been doing all along. So, all right, enough abstraction. Let's actually use this to do an interesting problem. Okay, so this is something called Snell's Law in geometrical optics uh, or in wave mechanics, much of physics. Uh, so here's the, the statement. We have this beam of light, which begins at a point P and ends at a point Q, which I've drawn here and we've kind of split the space into an upper half plane and a lower half plane. So I'm describing the top part as y is greater than zero and the bottom part as y less than zero. And the, the thing that makes this interesting is we assume that the light has different speed in the upper half plane and the lower half plane. So it has speed v1 when you're above, say y greater than zero, and speed v2 when you're below, y less than zero. If you like, you can think of this as a pool, right? So water has different speeds in air and water because if you have a bunch of water molecules and air is moving through, it's going to get absorbed by some water molecules and re-emitted, and it goes in circles because it keeps getting absorbed and re-emitted, and this slows it down. So light travels more slowly in water than air. That's why the V is different. That's one example. Okay, so if we assume these two speeds are given to us, and we assume also that light always travels along a path which minimizes its travel time. This is something sometimes called Fermat's principle. And I can't actually prove this to you without going into greater detail about physics than is really appropriate at the moment, but we can take that as given that the light wants to minimize its travel time. Then the problem asks us to use that that assumption to find an equation which relates these two angles, theta 1 and theta 2, to the speeds v1 and v2 of the light in the two media. Okay, so first, before asking you to present some ideas, the most obvious thing you would, you, you would ask when seeing this problem is why doesn't the light just take a straight line path? Right, I thought the shortest distance between two points was always a straight line. That's true in terms of distance, but we're now talking about time, and your speed is different in these two media. So just to get some intuition for this, if you assume, say, here's a shore, so there's water here, 
and maybe you're a lifeguard who's standing right here. And then you notice at time t equals zero that there's some, I don't know, there's a, another human who's drowning over here. So this is a drowning person and the lifeguard wants to reach the drowning person as quickly as possible, you might say, okay, why doesn't the lifeguard take a straight line path from his current position to the drowning person? And doing this would be very stupid, obviously, because the lifeguard knows that he can move much more quickly on land, in the sand when he's running, as opposed to in the water where he has to swim, and swimming is much more slow. So the intelligent lifeguard would naturally try to move more, maybe maybe not quite that much, but try to move more on land and then swim for the remainder of the distance because he knows that he's slower when he's swimming. So you want to spend more time in the area where you move faster in order to minimize the distance. So that's just the intuition for why this is not a single straight line. It's kind of piecewise linear, two different straight lines. But okay, so enough of the setup and intuition. So I will now ask you, uh, what should we do to convert this problem into an optimization question which we can solve with calculus? So I don't really have any ideas outside of thinking about um, uh, what was I thinking? Discord's being. <laughs> I was going to say you're getting your your Discord is blowing up. I'm, I do not have any ideas. I'm going to continue thinking. Okay. I mean. Roughly, intuitively, we're trying to decide why would the light take this path as opposed to some other path like maybe this one. So this path apparently is not as good, and this path is apparently not as good. So the problem is that optimizing over paths is really hard. Like how do you enumerate all of the possible paths that this light is going to take? So can you see a way to convert this collection of paths, which right now I've just drawn a few in pink, a few examples. Can you convert this collection of paths into something which is labeled by a single number, right? If you can find a single number so that, you know, each of these paths has a unique number associated with it, some number X. And then we can say, now we're just going to write the travel time as a function of that one number x. So it's a function of a single variable. That's much easier to do. So my question to you is, what number x should we use to label, or as we often say, parameterize these different paths? So the way that the present, well, our example here has it, can we assume that this, our axis begins where at the, well, where this beam of light intersects the axi, axis is throughout something. This thing, okay, so you want to say uh, this thing is zero where it intersects this interface, so to speak. But the problem is then that means that that origin is going to be different for different paths, right? So you want to call that zero, but we're trying to label all these different paths. So we can't call the point of intersection zero for all of them, right? So somehow we need to assign a different number to each of these paths and say, okay, this intersects at some different value x and this value, you know, this intersection point is something other than x, right? So let me make that a bit more explicit. So maybe, maybe as you say, we 
choose one origin and then we assign some Cartesian coordinates to say the point P I don't know what do you want this to be something like uh, uh, maybe it's maybe the distance between P and Q is L or something I don't know so if this whole thing is L it sounds like you want to put the origin at some point which is like I don't know maybe X away from point P so I don't know then we have to pick another number for the height maybe this is A so it sounds like you want to put this guy at like I don't know minus X because he's to the left and some other point A and you want to put Q I don't know maybe this is B so maybe Q, since the, the total distance between these guys is fixed, it's L. Maybe this guy is supposed to be like L minus X, since I've made X positive, and B. I'm just making up numbers at this point, but uh, is this close to what you had in mind, where you were, you were assigning a, a, an origin and then trying to kind of label the points P and Q in reference to that origin? question somewhere in there yeah I mean I, I was just asking if this, <laughs> if this is close to what you had in mind if not we can do something else but this is my best attempt to render what you just said <laughs> I said like one sentence I was trying to unpack the sentence but... okay well oh, this okay. is more productive than I could ever have ever been Quick question. are you recording yes I do believe so yes we are recording good so the stuff going on in Discord is pretty bad. What is it on uh, on JT Nerds or something? Um, DMs, Bernadette. Oh, okay. So you are uh, you have personal things. Do you want to, you know, pause or cancel today to deal with your DMs? Um, no, we can continue. <laughs> I don't know if I can continue. Uh, I, I can can't. I mean, if you want to deal with that, we can just you know pick this up next time. I don't want to to uh, detract from you know pretty bad social things happening. Yeah, I think I. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. So, I will stop recording and. Uh, yeah.